Welcome to Unite Now, where we bring unity to you, wherever you are. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Educators Building the Future, Lessons from the Front Lines. We'll learn firsthand from amazing individuals who are shaping the future of XR. I'm Carl Domingo, a program manager on the education team here at Unity, and I'm excited to introduce our speakers for this session. First, we'll hear from Andrew Connell, a freelance simulation engineer and the creator of VR with Andrew on YouTube about his work as a content creator and educating people online about XR. Then, Drew Davidson, director of Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center, will describe how his project-based program engages innovative learning. With that, we'll hand it over to Andrew. Thanks, Carl. Hi. My name is Andrew. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my journey into XR and what it's like sharing my knowledge and experience when I'm educating online. But before we get into it, like, what are we going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking a little bit about who I am, what I do, how did I get started, why XR in the first place, and then talking a little bit about my work. So first and foremost, who am I? I'm a simulation engineer. I'm a freelancer. I'm an XR educator. If you haven't noticed, I'm also a bald guy and I wear other people's sunglasses when I take photos, especially in this picture right here. Overall, I'm a bit of a generalist. I don't really, or when I first started, I really didn't intend to become a developer. I initially wanted to do something like graphic design or art, but I ultimately fell into development and more specifically XR pretty much on accident. But what does this all mean? I say that I'm a simulation engineer, I'm a developer, now, what does that exactly mean? You know, as a developer, I typically find myself building small XR projects, games, and simulations for clients. I generally work with small teams consisting of designers, artists, subject matter experts. I take a lot of input from everyone on the team, and I take that design and I make it a reality. And then as an XR educator, I primarily create content on YouTube. I've been doing it for a little bit over two years. I primarily focus on creating informative, simple videos for learners of a either beginner to intermediate skill set. And then while also primarily having an online presence, I also try to keep with my community as a whole when I'm on YouTube or when I'm on Discord on a daily basis. So I guess the question is, how do, how do you get started into this? Or how did I more particularly get started in this? I finished college about five or six years ago. And at the time I was interning at a multimedia research lab. You know, I eventually got a job as a developer there and I worked there for about two and a half years. I got a lot of early experience with augmented and mixed reality hardware, virtual reality, motion capture. This proved to be very formative in my very early years. I was constantly facing development and design challenges. So, I, so like many things in life, I stumbled into the world of XR. And I just tried to do my best to make sense of it all. And these two images that I'm showing right now are pretty telling of that. On the left image here, it's a photo from a game jam from years ago that was held at a local science center that I went to right after I graduated. A friend and I created a motion controlled game where you built sandwiches. It was this little silly thing that we wanted to make and we wanted to play into the impreciseness of tracking at the time and we wanted to make something that was a bit silly, chaotic, so something that wasn't going to cause a lot of frustration. And this was one of my first experiences when I was building games that didn't involve a keyboard, a mouse, or a controller. And then the image on the right, it's one of the first pieces of code, pieces of code that I wrote in Unity while I was in school. And for whatever reason, I get a really good laugh out of the first if statement in the update where I run a timer and where I check for the color of a material because for whatever reason, I don't know why I did it, but I just thought it was a good idea at the time. I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I think that particular line of code is particularly hilarious to me and it sticks out to me when I think about where I've come from and where I am right now. But that was several years ago. Like today, like why XR, you know? Ultimately, like I said in the beginning, it was on accident. I was getting into the industry about the time that the first consumer headsets were coming out. And we as developers were sort of getting the first impressions of hardware capabilities and where it may take us into the future. It was a very exciting time. I think that's what kept me interested for so long. The intriguing design challenges and problems to figure out. 
I also like the inherent advantage VR has when creating atmosphere and immersion. That's always been what I enjoy most. However, exciting as all of this was, it was daunting for some developers and students who were looking to get into the XR space. I certainly went through my fair share of difficulties, still do today, since it's an emerging medium with very few options for learning content. This is where I began to think, maybe one day I'll make tutorials for all the stuff I learned over the past couple of years. And that's kind of where it all started. The photo here on the right is one of my very early mixed reality projects. This was in a time before tracking using base stations or lighthousing. Lighthouses were standard for tracking. Um, this headset used a marker system that was quite processed, quite a process to sort of set up and calibrate. And this puts into perspective how the technology has come so far for both consumers and developers, and obviously we're really grateful for it. But after working at a research lab for about two and a half to three years, I left that job to try and freelance and spend some time on personal projects. Naturally, I'm still trying to find that time to work on personal projects. Again, I was starting to think about this time, maybe I should and try and make tutorials. What's the worst that could happen? So I started. Um, it's been over two years, more than 150 videos in Unity and virtual reality. I'd say it's gone pretty well. My goal or approach has always been make content for the developer that I was years ago when I first started doing VR work. And as of late, I've primarily focused on doing VR content for input, complex interactions, and locomotion. A lot of this content focuses on utilizing Unity's new XR toolkit, which I feel is a great lightweight solution for doing interactions. And then along with all the learning content that I create, I try and stay active in my community whether it's via my YouTube comments or in my Discord chat. You know, this is usually to help fix someone's issue or try to adapt a piece of code that I've written to something that someone in particular wants to do for their project. And even though the VR space is full of a lot of options when it comes to interaction systems, I try and make simple systems for learners that they can recreate them, they can exper experiment with them, and they can add on to it. You know, if a viewer says, hey, this wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but I managed to take pieces and parts of it and implement it into my own project, you know, that's great. That's exactly what I want you to be doing. I want to encourage learners to have understanding and a sense of ownership of what goes into their project, but also create their own problems and their own solutions. That's ultimately where I feel like a lot of the learning takes place. But with those sort of problems, I also encounter community requests. So when I make a project, someone would say, hey, you know, it would be really cool if you added this onto it. You know, if time permits, sometimes I get the opportunity to do that. Um, a while back, I made a bow and arrow project. And the image on the left here shows that someone asking me to say, hey, can you create a, an enemy that you can damage that also has a death animation? And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And I ended up putting together an additional video for the series, and it had a few buck few bug fixes from the community as well. And this is one of the reasons why I'm as active as I am. I'm looking to see what people want, what how people are using what I'm creating, and try and create useful comments. So for people in the future that are watching my videos, they can also see any fixes that we may have come up with and like while we were talking about it. Um, but for this particular thing, even though they asked for a death animation, I couldn't find one. So we just made the skeleton dance when he took enough damage. Um, but most recently, within the past month, I helped organize a VR jam where we had a lot of participants. We held it on itch. We had a bunch of wonderful projects from a bunch of different developers of different skill levels. We ultimately had about 500 participants. We officially had about 90 projects submitted. We may have had up to 100, but you know how game jams are. Sometimes projects don't make it in for whatever reason. Um, the best part of the jam, once it was all over, is that everyone got the opportunity to play in rate and give constructive feedback to everyone to everyone else's game and it was very encouraging to see that everyone was leaving very nice helpful encouraging feedback so that was something that that i really liked and it really makes me want to do another jam in the future but here are a couple projects that i personally liked a lot from the game jam this first one is called sublab vr it's where you control a small underwater drone and collect coral samples that you're that you get to analyze in your sort of mobile submarine lab it had a great extra like educational component to it. It looked great. And you got to uh, sort of control your little drone from a first person perspective and get to switch between your big sub and your little drone. So I thought that was really cool. And then the second 
It's called Leaf Blower Simulator, which don't let it fool you like it fooled me. While I was playing it and rating all the games, this one came out to be quite a surprise. You know, you kind of start out cleaning your front lawn with a leaf blower, kind of like you would expect from a game called Leaf Blower Simulator. But after exploring the yard, I found a secret little hatch that was tucked into the corner. I honestly didn't know it was there. And the game quickly turns into this puzzler where you use the leaf blower to solve different puzzles to get through the entire maze, essentially. And I thought this was incredibly interesting and risky simply because there may be a lot of people who see it at face value and they go, this just looks like a regular simulator game. So I thought that was really cool. And that's actually it for me. Thank you for watching. Up next, Drew Davidson's going to share a bit about, about XR education and what it looks like at Carnegie Mellon, where he runs the Entertainment Technology Center. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate the introduction. As you said, my name is Drew Davidson. I'm here to chat about uh, preparing students for tomorrow's technology. A little bit about me. I'm the director and a professor of the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm also the founding director of the an editor of uh, the ETC Press, which is an open access experimental academic imprint. If you're curious to dig into more, you can find me on my personal website. So the Entertainment Technology Center, uh, once upon a time, Randy Pausch, one of the founders, called it the world's best playground. He said it needed an electric fence. What he meant by that was that uh, creativity really needs context and constraints within which to thrive. You can do anything you want, however long you want. You might not do your best work, but if there's tight time frame or budgets or goals, that really helps creativity thrive. We're a two-year professional master's program. We're kind of like an MBA, but instead of focused on business and finance, we're focused on um, creative design and development. Uh, we're very project-based curriculum with our students working on interdisciplinary teams together. We take about uh, 80 students a year. It's a two-year program, so we got about 160, 40 percent of our technical backgrounds, um, computer scientists, programmers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, 40% out of artistic background, 2D, 3D, visual effects, graphic design, and 20% from the middle all over, like music, creative writing, theater. Um, we do have business majors. We also have uh, people out of biology. Uh, ETC came out of this idea of combining art, technology, and design. It was um, co-founded out of the College of Fine Arts and the School of Computer Science 20 years ago. It's our 20th anniversary this year. Um, the idea was inspired by Randy Pausch, who did a sabbatical at Disney Imagineering, where he saw all these disciplines working together to create these amazing things. And he wanted to try to replicate that uh, in a program here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, our philosophy in terms of teaching is learn, work, and play. And what we mean by that is we want our students' educational goals um, to be met through the development of their creative, professional um, careers while they're here at students. Um, and a big way they do that is through those projects where they create these engaging experiences for us to play with, whether it's through learners, players, or users. So learn, work, play. Um, and when we talk about entertainment technology, what's really exciting is it's the breadth. Because of course, we talk a lot about games. We do a lot of VR and AR. Um, we also do animation and theme parks and uh, location-based installations, mess with robotics, do cross media. We're very curious about how all of that can also be applied for not just entertainment, but maybe education and learning, business and training, or the health and medical fields, or what about civics or social issues. Um, all of that together really inspires us in the work that we do. To start, before we dive into that deep work across fields, we do four core classes. Um, one's Building Virtual Worlds. It was started pioneered by Randy Pausch, where the students get put on teams of four or five, and they have two weeks to make something go. So it's just rapid prototyping class, where they're building something very, very quickly and often in Unity. Um, and so then they shuffle. A new team of four or five students, two weeks go. Shuffle, go. Shuffle, go. So it's a crazy class with a lot of work requirements. Um, next up to the intake, Visual storytelling, uh, it's a filmmaking story class for non-filmmakers. And the idea is um, getting them on teams as well to think about how the language of cinema, visual and audio can help us experience something and how stories really help engage us to understand things. And similarly, they're in that team class where they're making short films throughout the semester, but they're on the same team all semester long, where they're in this visual uh, building virtual worlds class where they're switching every two weeks. So they're managing team, managing time. Um, then last but not least, they well, not, well, they take improv next, improvisational acting. All the students go through improvisational acting together. This is not so that they can be better actors or actresses or better comedians, but so that they can learn the whole yes and philosophy of sharing ideas and sharing credit um, and collaborating together in ways that are very visceral as they learn to serve the narrative as opposed to being the star. And then we teach a fundamentals class that's really like, so you're interested in 
career in the creative industries? How do we help prepare you for that? Because after they go through that first semester, they do these semester long projects. Um, they usually tend to work there about 40 hours a week to maybe 80 hours a week. Um, there's a variety of types of projects we do in terms of you know, things that are physical installations or games or short films, things on mobile or virtual reality or augmented reality. We're trying to track a balance on the team so they have a good mix of disciplines to set them up for success. And they can also be ranging from client-sponsored projects where we have a client give them those goals. And it can be a for-profit or a nonprofit group. It can be driven by research and grants and students can pitch their own idea through a green light process and some of the most fun projects come out of pitches. So the big head fake for us is that ETC is really not about XR. It's not about technology or media. It's about the experience. Randy Powell, in his last lecture, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you Google and find it. It's a great talk. Really talks about how, you know, you, students get seduced by all the technology in our building. But what really we want you to do is think about the experience you want. We want you to think about how to be creative together. And that's the challenge of how you really address technology that you don't know is going to exist or the technology of tomorrow that hopefully will all work on together. So we focus on that sort of experiential creativity through like imagination and innovation and the idea of how you sort of dream up these ideas, but then how do you start giving them a purpose? And that's, you know, developing those skills, but also the process to going through that together. So there's a focus on helping individuals tap into the idea of being creative, but really also to help groups do it together so they can share each other's expertise as they're coming from all these different backgrounds um, to uh, really do something they've never done before together. I like to say, if you're a team and you're doing exactly what you know you want to do and you're just following the steps, that's not creative work at all. You have to push yourself farther than that. And that's why we call it um, creative chaos. Uh, I think the creative process is inherently full of ambiguous ideas and uncertain results as you're trying to figure out and sort of like prototype your way and iterate your way through your design to make the, the right design for that audience, that, um, that moment. So you have to get really comfortable with those unknowns and be flexible in your process as you sort of play test your way towards uh, um, that final product that will actually work for you big part of getting comfortable with those unknowns is improvisational acting. This really is, I think, one of the better ways to prepare for technologies for tomorrow. It's following that yes and philosophy I mentioned earlier, and it's all about how you shake those experiences together, get really comfortable with that type of chaos. Because when you're on stage, it's visceral. You're trying to create something together from nothing. And that's creativity in a nutshell. And so we hope it translates into these projects where they're trying to serve the story. Maybe the story is the client's goals or the need for it to be an XR or, you know, the need that you're working with kindergarten. You just, so it's less about you having the best algorithm or the best art, more about making sure everything goes and serves that story together. So that collaborative experience really takes people diving in together. A lot of people talk about collaboration and like here's one version of it where you can see sort of an academic context. We often get funders or support organizations that want to get researchers to study or do something that goes to, we often sub out and get some designers and developers involved to help us with a, the prototyping and we would then probably partner with some educators if it has sort of an educational goal try to talk to some you know kindergarten teachers or um, elementary teachers and then those are the students at the end of this little waterfall they're getting soaking wet with all of our good intentions to make something to improve their learning or improve how they engage in something we find it much better to do a more co-creative process in terms of collaboration where all these sort of stakeholders if you will are involved at the same time um, throughout the process and they feel like they're part and they have a voice and can be heard throughout the experience. We find that's very much more successful and collaborative process. And again, like as you're going through that process, we always want the students and the teams to really focus on the experience they're trying to make. This is a critical creative process where they want to sort of step back and think about why they're making what they're doing and are they aiming towards their goals. And so that's to, you know, give us, the user, the player, the guest, you know, this amazing experience that maybe it be educational or medical or just pure entertainment. And throughout, we talk about ways to help sort of measure that through play testing, whether it's beta testing, focus testing. Um, also, just thinking about how you have interest curves or the flow of the experience, just how you get us engaged interactively throughout this experience is something we really want our teams to focus on as they're making the design. We're strongly believe in transformational experiences. And what we mean by that is, can you make a design that actually has an impact outside of the experience so that you can use your creativity for good, use those powers and take that responsibility and maybe make positive changes in our daily lives through the things that you create and make. It's something we hope our students and our teams leave and go forth and aspire to do as they go out into the world. 
And for us, it's sort of like a literacy that involves curiosity. It's like everything I'm talking about is really about a lifelong skill of being comfortable of learning something you've never done before, challenging yourself so that you're comfortable to step up and do that throughout time. Um, how can you create your own sort of process in that regard is, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you're going to do something you've never done before. Um, like our current crop of students right now, they're doing something they've never done before, before they even graduate as they went through their last semester online and that pivot. So we really believe that's the lifelong skill that sets them up for um, doing creative work across their careers. And for that, when we talk about creative work, we're borrowing from Disney and the idea of how do you make that magic happen? Um, so that it's not just, you know, your imagination and going crazy. It's like, how does, how's it innovative? And for us, innovative is not only just new, does it have a purpose? Is it useful? And is it something that's good quality? Um, so we really work through the design process and creative problem solving. It's a collaborative creative process they go through together to sort of, again, iterate towards that magical moment um, that they find is through that process. And these are just a quick little example. If you ever go to our website, you can find out these are some recent XR projects. Almost all of them were done with Unity software that range from storytelling to educational projects to uh, straight up training um, to experimental exploration to something that's much more about trying to make a prototype that actually works. This just gives you a sense of, you know, what we're excited about in terms of media kind of extends beyond media so that our students are comfortable in, in tackling whatever sort of platform that they may have to use in the end. With that, I'd just like to thank you for your time and attention in this, and I look forward to talking to you more. Thanks so much. Bye. With that, I want to remind everyone watching that there are incredible resources for both learning and teaching on our Learn website at learn.unity.com. Especially for those educators out there, make sure to check out our Unity Teach group on Facebook. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon.